morning, everyone. I'm very excited for this panel. Um, I, I just want to um, start out with kind of introducing everyone on our panel today by having each of them talk about the biggest issue they're facing and their kind of realm they work in. Um, Rosalinda, can we start with you? Sure. So, so I'm, a, I'm Rosalinda Guillen. I uh, am a farm worker from Skagit County. I'm the director and founder of Community to Community Development, which is a women-led, intentionally women-led organization working on food sovereignty and farm worker issues. I think that the biggest issue we're facing right now, in which is, a, it, it's always been a critical issue for us as farm workers based in the United States, but the labor issues in dealing with the, the economic balance of how you address agricultural um, problems and imbalances in agriculture and farming and food production and labor, especially when it comes to farm workers growing the food and harvesting the food in the United States, is becoming an even more huge issue in this co current political moment. Thank you. Whitney. Um, so in the world of school food and child nutrition, um, I think there's some great things going on, and the problem is we're not aware of them and promoting it. Um, specifically protecting funding, um, adequate funding to do great things and continue to do the great things that we're seeing in school food. Um, and then changing the way that we look at the school food environment, um, particularly removing the socioeconomic status from the cafeteria, looking at the cafeteria as another learning lab or classroom space and protecting time for our students to enjoy their meals and um, share a meal together. Wonderful, thank you. Sarah, how about you? I'm Sarah Morris, president of the Beechers Foundation, and we really approach this issue from the consumer um, part of the equation and um, through education work on um, educating youth and adults um, to basically harness their own um, consumer power. And you know the, the most giant problem that we face, which is a problem that we all face collectively, is frankly, the toxic stew of overly processed food that gluts the American marketplace. Um, we've become so conditioned to eating in a way that is so different from the way humans have eaten for most of millennia, and on average, 58% of the calories that every American consumes on a daily basis comes from highly processed food. Um, and so our work is really trying to sort of turn that proverbial tanker around and return us back to a more natural, healthy way of eating. Wonderful, thank you. Katie. So I'm Katie Rains with Grub down in Olympia. We're a community nonprofit. And there are kind of three themes that I'd love to touch on over the time today. Um, one of them is thinking about advocating for youth. And a key point there is remembering that young people are people. And that means that they're, they're aware of the experiences they're having. They're aware of the food that they have access to. And they have ideas. Um, and those ideas can shape what's showing up in the cafeteria. Those ideas, in fact, can shape what's happening in the classroom. And sometimes that classroom can be a farm. Um, we, as a society, it's not personal, because I know lots of incredible educators. We are over-testing and undernourishing young people. And we have a powerful chance to engage students on the farm and the classroom um, and help transform the food system from within institutions and leverage the resources available those, to those institutions to create that change. Um, representation, in our community we have a local food system network. And like this summit, one of the things we recognize is that the food system is so complex and comprehensive. It covers everything from distribution, transportation, waste, consumerism, and everything in between. Um, and when you bring those diverse perspectives together, in many cases, that still looks like people with a certain amount of power and privilege having the conversation. Um, at our local food summit, what we tried to do to mitigate that was bring together um, a set of scholarships and partner with organizations who are working with folks who are underserved or underrepresented at decision-making tables. That looked like about a third of our attendees coming to the event at no cost. That looked like seniors, kids, childcare, free food, um, Certainly, there were places to grow. Uh, it was all in English. There were lots of barriers that remained. But beginning to push the conversation forward and make sure that people who are affected by inequities in the food system are shaping the changes that we're trying to make together. 
And then when we talk about women in the food system, women are powerhouses for buying food, for caring for their kids, for caring for their families. Um, while we've come a long way as a society, women are still the ones more often than not asking themselves the question, how do I feed my family well? And how do I make sure that my family is healthy? And as such, they're allocating a lot of a household's resources um, and we can, we can continue to do better there. Thank you so much. Um, so of course we're focusing on women and our children. And I'm wondering if uh, any of you um, can jump in on this, can discuss uh, what gender imbalance in your field or what socioeconomic uh, inequality contributes to uh, barriers in either access to land, access to healthy food, um, leadership positions. Um, Rosalind, I know you probably have some feelings about this. Um, would you be willing to kind of address that? Sure. I mean, historically, farm workers have been some of the poorest workers in the nation. Um, the average lifespan of a farm worker in the United States is still 49 years. Uh, there, is many, there are many reasons for that, poverty being one of, the, one of the largest, the biggest reasons. I think that I, as a farm worker and many others my age that have worked the fields of Washington State have lived in generational poverty forever. Um, it goes all the way back to generations in my family in Texas and other places where we've been migrant workers. So as women, I mean, that just follows the line, right, that um, women have always worked in the fields in the United States. Uh, it's always been extremely difficult. The food production that everybody's been talking about, the way that food is produced in this country is incredibly dangerous, not just for consumers and what they eat, but also we are the farm workers on the ground that are exposed to toxic chemicals before it reaches you, the consumer, in the grocery store. So uh, there are many issues, especially with farm worker women working in the fields with, you know, being pregnant and early pregnancies and having to work because they have to, because that's the, they have no other choice. I want to mention just uh, recently we found out we've been um, observing current practices in many of the, especially the big corporate farms in Washington State, we have actually seen farm worker women going into the fields this winter to prune with children strapped to themselves as they go in to prune. These are not organic uh, berry fields. These are conventionally farmed berry fields. And so this is today, this was just this last winter. So there are many dangers um, of exposure for farm worker women at many levels. I mean, the representation of farm workers in general in anything that has to do that, it, with anything that has to do with agriculture that affects farm workers, we just don't have it. We are fortunate enough to finally, in Washington State after 30 years, have a, an independent locally led farm worker union, Familias Unidas por la Justicia. Yeah. So they are a very fierce, fearless and fierce advocate for the workers in the fields in Washington State. We hope that we can get the support to begin to create a change and have advocacy for ourselves in, in many areas. But for women, farm worker women, as you saw in the Me Too, Too movement, for us, this is the way of life. It's actually almost a culture in the fields for us to find ways to protect ourselves from the men, from supervisors and abusive, um, other abusive um, leaders in the field, uh, especially supervisors that are, I mean, sexual harassment in the fields is a way of life in the workplace for farm worker women. So um, I could go on and on, but these are just a few of the things just to get started. It's, it's, a, it's very difficult for farm worker um, workers in the state of Washington. And I believe that you cannot and should not, and it is morally wrong to address changes in food production in Washington state without us at the table. Yes. Um, anyone else want to jump in on this? <laughs> it's hard to follow Rosalinda, but um, anyone else on this matter? Maybe not in farms, but just in your fields? I think one, one point that I would add um, and to, to sort of uh, agree with the passion um, is, you know, Washington State and certainly Puget Sound generally has a reputation of health and progressivism, um, but in fact, our region suffers from um, some of the worst health disparities um, in relative to like regions. So um, in King County alone, uh, 
women's life expectancy can differ by as many as 14 years and men by as many as 18 years based on what zip code you live in. And those disparities are driven in large measure by diet-related disease. And that is unconscionable. And uh, it is an economic and moral imperative that we address statistics like that. And that's a lot of what drives our work around educating consumers. Absolutely. Anyone else move on? <laughs> Um, so clearly we have an aging farm population that's um, leaving a growing void in, in the industry. Uh, what challenges do we face and how do we incentivize women and young adults to fill the void, to get excited about farming, to at least feel more connected to their food? Um, what's being done there? Rosalinda, <laughs> I'm start again. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I, I have to say that it's bittersweet for us as farm workers to see the truth in uh, family farming in Washington State. It is true. I mean, you know, farmers are aging and their children do not want to continue farming the land that we, we work for them. Farm workers work for these older farmers. Uh, farm workers are a landless workforce. We don't own land, we work for people that own land. So it is, it's clear to us the difficulty that family farmers are having keeping their farms and being able to pay decent wages to farm workers and other labor that works for them to keep the farm going. So it is, it is a problem. I think that you know, there's many organizations working on trying to change that, but it's a, it's a cultural issue and it's an economic issue. And farm workers, there are many farm workers ready to, and a lot of other immigrant peasant farmers that have immigrated to Washington State to have the skills to take family farming into a new, into a new era. Um, but we don't have the economic access to be able to get to that land and to be able to farm traditional farming practice from the land we came from. So I think there's a lot of opportunities if there is land access and cooperation and collaboration between aging farmers and counties in Washington State to, to change the dynamic. Um, I believe, Whitney and Katie, you had some ideas about um, just introducing children to kind of farming or gardening on a small scale. Do you want to address that? So in um, Portland Public Schools, we have over 70 school gardens um, and community gardens uh, throughout our district. Um, and there are various partners uh, that help us to connect those garden um, efforts to the cafeteria and to the classroom. Um, but it does take an effort. Um, and I would say that there's not a coordinated um, effort or support for that, but uh, we try to do our best. Um, my department has provided funding specifically to these partners to um, invest in the seeds or the plants or whatever they need um, to help grow, particularly those that are in the uh, more at-risk, economically disadvantaged um, schools. Um, and then um, on another realm, trying to um, really focus on locally purchased foods. Um, so that's something that our district has been known for and kind of leading an effort. Right now, we currently purchase 36% of our purchases are local. Um, and that uh, means that over $2.2 million are, of federal dollars are reinvested into the local economy. Um, and so we really try to make sure that we're using geographical preferences within our purchasing efforts um, and trying to use strategic and innovative ways for procurement so that we can um, put that money back into our families, into our farms, um, and then show our kids where the food is coming from. Cool. Katie? Yeah. So I'll offer just a brief history of our youth engagement program at Grubb. Um, in, well, starting 20 years ago, actually, we started working with young people on our farm uh, in Olympia on a small urban farm. And in 2009, we were approached by a local high school principal saying, I'm seeing dramatic transformations in the students who are part of your program. How do I embed that in my school? Um, so as far as champions go, uh, Matt Grant from Olympia High School really was one for this program and for the students of his district. Um, the students that we serve, you'd say that many of them have had to grow up fast. Um, more than half have grown up in poverty. Um, or don't have adequate support systems at home, or just can thrive and engage in their education when they're doing something that's relevant to their own lives, that's relevant to their community, by growing food for the food bank, for each other, and so on. So we've had this program for 20 years. 2009, Matt approaches us and said, hey, how can I get this in the school? And took a couple of years to plan and did a two-year pilot with Olympia School District 
And that pilot was turning a farm into a classroom so that students were engaged in a block period and earning three credits by learning on the farm. Um, over the course of that two years, um, I think about 65 students were involved in the program, and we were able to do some comprehensive evaluation. Um, within that period, students across the board either maintained or increased the number of credits they were earning, behavioral issues decreased dramatically, and GPAs went up, and specifically science GPAs went up. When it's practical, when it's real, when it's not just a textbook, when it's not just an exam, we can make meaning of the world around us. Um, so science GPAs went up 87% in that two-year pilot, huge. Um, so fast forward, after the success of that program, we were winding down the second year of the pilot in 2013, and Representative Reichdahl uh, introduced a bill that was kind of affectionately known as the Grub Bill. And it was a bill saying, we have an opportunity, like his vision was for every high school in the state of Washington to have a farm and that farm to be a classroom where students can engage in their education in a meaningful way, where food insecurity and food disparities can be addressed in every community, and where we can inspire young people not necessarily to become farmers. We don't believe that every student that goes to our program is gonna to choose to farm. We believe that they're gonna have a better understanding of the relationship between their health and their food choices. We believe that they're gonna have more respect for the hard labor of farm workers across our state. Um, we also make sure that we provide some education about the disparity and inequities in farm worker systems, particularly wages, mass, I grew up in Eastern Washington, mass exploitation of immigrants, it's awful. Um, so students have a chance to see the food system in a really robust way and can then choose to go on and pursue education in agriculture. And many of our students do, certainly not all. So that's an opportunity, and another piece of that is we get to bring some of that food in certain programs to the school district. So um, we've now had a chance to work with three different districts, Olympia School District, Tumwater School District, and now Eatonville School District, and they're all independently operating a farm program that's engaging students on the farm and getting some of that food into the district, which subsidizes some of the food cost um, for the district nutrition services. So one, of the, one of the things I wanted to mention is that Community to community has a um, culturally appropriate cooper uh, cooperative development curriculum. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we are doing is putting farm workers who are interested in developing their own farming co-ops, the worker-owned farming co-ops together. So we have, a, we have groups of farm, worker that, farm workers that want to farm going through a process of becoming worker-owned cooperative farming groups. And in that process, then, we are looking for land because it doesn't do any good to start farming if you don't have access to land. But that's one way that immigrant farm workers are looking to establish themselves and contribute to food production and be able to move away from just being, um, you know, a labor force for other people that own lands, but to actually farm for themselves. And the most important part of this, I think, in addressing the, the immigrant uh, population that's here is that they're choosing to grow culturally appropriate foods for themselves and their populations. So there are already markets waiting for them to, to sell that, that product, including you know, food-related products like tortillas. And for us, that's really important that we have the culturally appropriate organic non-GMO corn tortilla. And that's a big goal. Um, we still have to reach that goal, but that's one of the things we're working towards is a worker-owned uh, tortilla factory. Oh. Yeah. So you all are doing a lot within your nonprofits and, and small and smaller, more local government agencies. But uh, of course, you can be affected by federal dollars and policies. Um, what legislation or ideas or, or proposals are before Congress or state lawmakers that affect your fields? Um, can we start at this end, maybe, if you have something to say? Sure. <laughs> um, one small celebration. So I mentioned that Representative Reichdahl launched a bill back in 2013 called the Grub Bill. Um, that bill went through a couple of years and you know, made it to committee and didn't pass. The first year, it actually ended up with a budget proviso. So OSPI, the um, Superintendent of Public Instruction, was able to grant some small dollars to a couple of school districts to try out the program. But there was no policy backing it up. 
Um, so that happened the first year. It made it through several sessions. And then this year, it was repackaged as part of um, the Breakfast After the Bell package. So it was House Bill 1508. And the governor just signed that into law last week. So schools across Washington state that have um, more than 70% students enrolled for free or reduced meal programs will be required starting in the 2019 school year to offer breakfast after the bell options. That could be grab and go, that could be breakfast in the classroom, so that more students are able to be nourished um, when they get to school, because sometimes there's a really tight window between when the bus drops you and when class starts. Alongside that, some interesting parts of that legislation were that they mandated coordination between organizations that understand hunger and the opportunity gap um, so that OSPI and school districts are educated about what students really need and the resources in that community. So mandating collaboration is cool. And um, the other piece is that they included a provision for programs like GRUB um, for dropout reengagement through farm-based education and food security building across the community. Now the downside of that that still affects us, but we're still young in this policy process, honestly, um, there was no line item that went with any part of the mandate for schools to integrate farms and community organizations. So um, there's no money. There's a nice policy that will last for two years, but no money behind it. Um, but it's a baby step, so we'll count it. The other thing that I'll add without going into too much detail is that before working at Grubbed, I work in healthcare. And I know that Representative Blumen, Blumenauer? Yeah. He mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the farm bill is directly related to health care costs in this country. Um, one of the things that folks might not realize, still a third of people don't realize that Affordable Care Act and Obamacare is the same thing. It is the same thing. Um, and one of the interesting things that's happening in Washington State as a result of the Affordable Care Act was that we were one of the, or or one of the states that applied for a state innovation model, which was a federal project. And so, um, our healthcare authority is in a contract with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid that enabled what they call the Medicaid transformation waiver. This is the first time since I've tracked any part of healthcare that there are opportunities for federal Medicaid dollars to be used for non-clinical health interventions. The opportunity for things like prescription gardens or prescriptions for food when that is most needed is on the table. And there are regional organizations called Accountable Communities of Health that are the ones kind of stewarding that process. And it's a diverse coalition still mostly comprised of healthcare professionals. And the silos between the food system and healthcare are still pretty strong, in my opinion. So there are some opportunities to start looking at ways that we can make smarter investments and kind of put the farm back in pharmacy. Awesome. <laughs> I don't remember that one. Sarah, is there anything on your radar? Yeah, I mean, our, our work is uh, focused on direct education, mm -hmm. um, teaching fourth and fifth graders how to become food detectives mm -hmm. and learn how to read labels and understand how ingredient lists are ordered and see through marketing messages that are targeted at them because they are youth and cook from scratch. And then our adult program is about teaching adults to really <laughs> unlock their own consumer power and understand as an individual as the leader of a family and as the leader of an employee peer group, how to harness consumer demand and basically demand that the marketplace reshape itself. So our goal is really to create armies of advocates who can then march on Olympia or march on Washington and be strong voices um, for their own health, their community's health, their family's health, and then who can advocate for smart policy solutions. So that's, that's how we enter this realm. Wonderful. Whitney, is there something going on in Oregon or at the federal level that will affect Absolutely. your schools? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at the, at the federal level, obviously, um, Representative Blumenauer talked about the farm bill and definitely keeping a pulse on that. Um, we want to have healthy farms and healthy families. And um, with that, we also don't have um, a child nutrition reauthorization yet. Um, so we want to make sure that we keep a pulse on the farm bill to know what to predict for CNR. Um, the other thing that's been floating around for some time has been the idea of block grants. 
um, for child nutrition programs. And that um, does not support um, our efforts of expanding and um, providing access to um, nutrition and healthy meals for kids. Um, it reduces our funding um, tremendously. For me, it would mean um, over $3 million loss um, just for Portland alone. And so that's not the way that, that we would like to see things go. So I um, want everyone to be aware of that at the national level. Um, there is an opportunity um, at the national level to, um, for public comment, and it's, um, there's a lot of opportunities right now for public comment, which is uh, pretty new and innovative for USDA to allow, um, between now and the end of March, you can um, go on and provide comment on the dietary guidelines for 2020, which will shape um, how we look forward um, for, for my programs, for child nutrition programs um, specifically. Um, Oregon, though, has been doing some pretty innovative things and um, started back in 2014. We actually, through partnerships and collaborations, and I know everyone here has been talking about that, and I just want to reemphasize how important that is, um, we were able to pass three bills just in regards to child nutrition programs um, and improving access um, for kids. So one of them was um, the first of its kind of farm to school um, bill that was passed. Um, and it actually um, got reintroduced this biennium, even in a budget shortfall. Um, our legislators heard and listened to their constituents and found $4.5 million um, to put towards uh, local food pur purchases, specifically Oregon food purchases for school districts with a component, um, a competitive grant component for school gardens and garden education. Um, so what that has done is inspired other states in the nation to do similar things um, and actually put dollars uh, towards that support. The other one was um, similar to what Katie talked about in Washington, um, but a little bit differently, was to define the first 15 minutes of the school day as academic time when breakfast is being served in the classroom or after the bell. And that was really critical um, in moving that direction of bringing food as part of the academic day. Um, there was really a, a disconnect and people um, had disbelief that um, students could be learning while they were eating. Um, and so it, it starts our, our process to think about a more holistic approach to, to the academic um, structure. Um, the other thing that was passed was the, um, the state picked up the copay for our reduced priced eligible families um, at lunch. And so while the state for almost a decade now has picked up the 30 cent copay for breakfast for those families, um, they now are picking up the 40 cent copay for lunch as well. So decreasing those barriers and access to food for um, those families in particular. And a lot of times these families um, are just above the cutoff for free meals. They're working hard families that are trying to make ends meet. And um, to come up with 40 cents for their kids for lunch was just not possible. Um, and they are also oftentimes the ones that are facing food insecurity. Um, so that allowed us to, um, to bridge that gap um, and also put us in one step closer as demonstrating what universal um, school meals could look like um, by removing the, that socioeconomic factor um, from school meals. Rosalinda, anything to add? Well, so there's, um, I think in the previous panel it was said that issues on food and especially food justice are definitely political. It seems like for farm workers everything we need and deserve is political. So there's a lot that we're dealing with. Unfortunately, most of the time the, um, in the political arena, it's a, we're always seem to be on the defensive. We're always trying to protect ourselves. So one of the biggest issue in the Washington State Legislature has always been this ongoing debate on the use of pesticides. How much, what, when, where, and how. And so we know that, it's the, those, that they're bad. And for us to be able to participate and implement regulations and laws that protect us in conventional agriculture, ideally we would like all food to be grown organically, but that doesn't seem to be possible in, in this world. As an organization who is working at the intersection of economic justice, food sovereignty, and climate justice, one of the biggest um, areas that we've been involved with in the last three years is in the development of equitable climate change policy. And so we were one of the organizations leading the, um, the discussion on developing the current initiative that's going to be on the ballot this coming year. So it's a Protect Washington Act because we as farm workers know that climate change is affecting our work right now, especially women. Um, in the fields. Climate change is affecting the type of chemicals, how much chemicals are being used, and how food is grown. The rising temperatures and everything is affecting our migration patterns, 
and also the work and how the work is done. So please support this um, initiative. Um, it's gonna be important because we're looking to the future to be able to survive. Um, we advocate really strongly for the development of food policy councils, whether they're local or statewide, because we believe that's one way that farm workers, that our communities can be incorporated into, in a comprehensive way in the production of food and all decision making. I believe food, poly, food policy councils is a way. Um, on a national level, but also here statewide, we're very concerned with the current administration's push to expand the, the federal guest worker program. That's an importing of guest workers to do labor on corporate farms. So we try to be involved and participate in any discussion on corporate farming and the growth of corporate farm that might displace family farmers. We strongly believe in a, fa a local family farming system in Washington State, that it's healthier for us and it's better for the community as a whole and produces healthier food. So this federal guest worker program is a threat to the farm worker communities that have been in Washington State for generations. I also want to say that I, I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing at the local level for low-income families because in access to food and ending hunger because in many rural communities, it's farm workers that need those programs. The very farm workers that are working in the fields to grow food can many times not afford the, the school lunch program and afford to buy the healthy food. So we do need to work together because my family was a beneficiary of some of these programs and we've seen the devaluement of those programs. So you know, ending the poverty of farm worker families, of course, is the best solution but working together to at least provide um, food, enough food for farm worker families is important. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanda. I think that's so important. I just wanted to um, put it in perspective that um, programs like mine, child nutrition programs within schools, are usually self-sufficient. They're not um, pulling from the general fund um, for academics. That means that my program is running off of maybe a little over $3 a meal to pay for food, labor, and equipment. Um, for a paid meal, I get maybe 39 cents max um, to pay for food, labor, and equipment. That is what I'm using to pay for food from farms and families. So if I had more, I could pay more. And my value is not to go for the cheapest food value. I look for other values in my food, but I want to be able to give the farmers what they deserve for the food that they're giving to me. Thank you. Um, we do need to get to Q&As pretty soon. Um, I just want to uh, have Sarah address a point on what she works on. I'm really interested in women as kind of um, decision makers for the family in terms of their purchasing power, um, feeding their families, doing meal planning. Um, and I, I want to know how is it that you do that, how you teach them what to look for, um, and what's the consumer's responsibility versus maybe um, the responsibility of uh, producers to properly label and, and make it clear what people are actually eating? Sure. Well, um, so the, a point was made on the earlier panel that, you know, food purchasing is about voting with your dollar. And it's so, it's incredibly powerful. Every consumer has some degree of dollar vote and dollar power in the system, and every dollar you spend on a thing votes for more of that thing to be produced. So um, we have an incredible amount of economic power ourselves. Um, we certainly, women, generally speaking, are sort of the food influencer in the family. We also really think about youth as food influencers. So they may not hold the purse strings, but kids are enormously influential in their families, whether it's around technology or um, food preferences. And so that's a, actually a big reason why we do work with fourth and fifth graders. And you know, I'll say not, not a week goes by when we don't hear an anecdote of a student who went through our program and came home totally indignant, lined up, you know, pulled all the cereals out of the cupboard, <laughs> read the labels, lined them all up in, you know, sort of order of sugar content, and basically drew, draw, draw, you know, drew a line and said, we're not buying those anymore. Wow. And yeah, it's great. It's incredible. Incredible. So we, we, we think a lot about sort of uh, who are the influencers in the family, and it is 
Um, it can be the kids, it can be the adults. For our adult program, a lot of times, our partners will want spouses involved, and so that creates a really important dynamic in the family. So it's really about identifying who in the family has different points of influence at different points in time, mm -hmm. and ensuring that they have the education to make the decisions that are best for their family. Absolutely, thank you. Um, now I wanna hear from you all. Uh, I do you have some? Oh, can I add just to the- Very quickly. Quick one. The vote with your dollar point. I wanna state the obvious really quick. When we say that, one of the things it also means is that if you have more dollars, you have more votes. And so at the community level, one important thing that we can think about is recognizing that those federal dollars like SNAP, like WIC, that those are dollars and votes too, and that communities can actively work to find matching programs, like farmer's market EBT matching programs, ways to amplify those dollars and those votes. So that's possible at the local level as well. Sorry. Wonderful, thank you. Um, question up front here. I'm actually asking a question on behalf of my coworker who's here with her infant, and she's in um, a nursing room that was set up. And so her question for this um, panel is, this is not a question about agriculture, but about breast milk as first food, a food justice issue which impacts both women and youth. What connections with this concept of the first food justice, if any, do you see in your work? Is it something you are thinking about as connected to your work? Anyone have thoughts on that? I think that um, I can speak a little bit to that. There are some early um, Head Start programs that have shifted some of their regulations to um, adopt um, a broader scope of including um, breast milk from moms to be served in the classroom um, with their Head Start or in the uh, vicinity of pre-K, um, being able to serve that to, um, to their students um, that are participating. It's a very good point, um, very much resonate with that, but I think that's a, a great aspect. Go ahead. For farm worker women, it's critical, uh, especially when they're working in big corporate conventional ag farms or living near in farm labor camps in big corporate conventional ag farm, farms. The pesticides, uh, different types of very toxic pesticides are present in the dust and in the air, and it most definitely affects uh, birth weight. Um, it affects everything, including the breast milk. So it's a huge issue for farm worker women, and I think that that's one area where in, in the policy arena, we have very little representation, and I'm glad you asked that question because it, it's a serious issue in the, in the farm worker um, arena, yeah. I think there just needs to be better support um, for working moms. Um, speaking from somebody who has a six-month-old at home right now, um, <laughs> coming back to work after six weeks um, is, is very difficult. And having the right um, uh, supports in place, not just the laws, but having a supportive environment is very important. So I think it's beyond the realm of kind of what we've been talking about today, um, but having the right um, environment and um, flexibility for time off and supporting um, the professional woman. Full disclosure, that's my coworker, and one of the ways it came up is that a few years ago with the Food System Network, um, the Breastfeeding Coalition in our community came to the table and said, if you're gonna report on the food system, let's talk about breastfeeding accessible places. And I was like, obviously that's the first food, that's the most nutrient dense food, and it's connected to the nutrition a mom can get. Um, can get. So we also in our workplace are really thoughtful about what a child and an, a mother need is more important potentially than the comfort of others. And so um, there's a balancing act there. We're certainly respectful of our high school students and perhaps that's not always appropriate or that's a conversation that was invited. Um, but it's not something that needs to happen in the bathroom. Um, your first food experience shouldn't be a shame thing that you hide in a stall. Um, it's something that can happen in a place that feels comfortable for you. Um, oh, next question. Hello. Um, my name is Emily, and You're I next, work sorry. for an organization called Seeds of Grace. And um, my question is mainly for Whitney and Katie. We have um, put in place 17 
sustainable garden and aquaponics programs in schools over in Kitsap County over the past four years. And one of the things that we run into most often is running up against local legislation, um, such as you know health district codes for having composting in schools is a big issue, and actually getting the food from our garden programs to the students. The only thing we're allowed to do right now is put it into our backpack programs and donate it that way or into food lines. So we're just wondering how did you guys overcome those kinds of things in Portland when you were putting in these programs? Sure. Um, I know that each county can have its own obstacles to um, taking uh, the school garden produce and putting it into the cafeteria. Luckily for us in Multnomah County, we have um, some standard food codes that we've been able to work within. Um, so just giving a guide um, to those who are working within the garden of what does it look like when you grow something? What are you growing? Um, how is it being washed before it makes its way into the kitchen or cafeteria? Um, and then what does my team do um, to prepare that and wash it and make sure that it's safe to consume in the cafeteria afterwards? So we put together just a guide and go over that with any of our partners um, and then um, work with the county if there's any concerns, um, particularly uh, in recent years about uh, the quality of the water or what's in the water um, was a concern. So we adjusted and, and tried to um, do our due diligence to make sure that we were still able to utilize that, that produce and connect the kids with what they had grown. Um, so it can be unique on what each county has adopted within their food code, but I would say that there's ways to um, work within the rules. Um, and I think that that's really where you have to find those innovators for what those rules are and how to make it um, connect with the kids. Similarly, um, we didn't really have to kind of fight that part of the fight. We had a school nutrition director for Olympia School District who was already a super advocate for farm to school and Thurston County health regulations were such that um, it wasn't a tremendous barrier. That being said, the only word of counsel I'd offer is if there's any type, so any type of network or collaborative that's addressing food issues in your community, um, bringing those folks together, because sometimes there are well-intended policies that just need to change, and having allies within those systems can really advance that. I'm sure you're already trying, but I wish you great success. I would suggest maybe looking for somebody in the county that's already doing it or is open to the idea, and then um, being strategic on how to make that less scary or, or even possible. We have a question over here. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm a small producer in the Sammamish Valley, um, and I have three schools within three miles um, of my uh, farm, and I got in touch with uh, the school uh, nutritionists to do a farm-to-school um, program or unprocessed fruits and vegetables program, and um, it seems that there's a moving target for me to qualify um, to be able to sell to schools. Uh, in my congressional district, I looked in on it because I was curious who did that. Um, there are seven qualified people to sell unprocessed fruits and vegetables to schools. Six of them are berry farms that are more than 100 miles away. One of them is an educational nonprofit um, that has a three acre uh, organic farm. Um, how can I reduce the regulations so that I can work directly with a nutritionist at a school or for a district to get them in and be able to pay my farm workers enough? This is a great panel. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, when you hear people talk about school food having so many regulations, um, it's, it's not just what you see in the media of the nutrition aspect. It's the purchasing, the procurement, um, filling those gaps. It's down to I'm regulated on what type of technology I can buy. I'm, it's approved vendors, approved food processors. I mean, it's all over the place. Um, so what I would say is um, work with... Um, I think don't go down that route. Ask the district, can you go out for a quote um, for what you're looking for? So we have this product. Do you want to offer this product to the kids, this food to the kids? Um, can you offer a quote? Um, it's within the procurement rules. 
you can um, get quotes, three competitive quotes for an item um, uh, if it's under $150,000. So a lot of small districts fall within that realm. Um, some people are really scared to go outside of that because there's procurement audits and there's regulations that they don't want to get in trouble for because it can actually mean them having to give back money. And that's really scary. They don't. They want to maintain the integrity of their program. I would say see if there's anyone in your um, area that's a good partner that can help bridge that gap. Um, one of the things that we did originally was um, way back when was work with partners like Ecotrust um, to help bridge the Got Amanda here coming up next. Um, that helped to bridge the gap between growers and buyers. And so that might help to navigate what that scene looks like at, at your local level. But there are opportunities. It just might take a little bit of time um, to make that possible. So be patient. Yeah. Um, if you all are like me, we could chat all day. I would yes. love to hear more from these ladies. But we have to wrap up. So can you join me in thanking our wonderful panelists? A quick thing from Rosalinda, please. Just really quick. Um, I just want you all to consider and to think about that farm workers are actually professional labor, that we are a skilled workforce that deserves more, uh, that deserves a place at every table. I also would like to let you know that as farm workers in our organizations, we always acknowledge that we are, we are working the land on Turtle Island and the stolen lands of the Coast Salish people and that we honor the indigenous and native lands and waters and that's why we fight to have organic agriculture and small family farming systems all the time and protect Mother Earth. Yes. Thank you.